I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Nina Antonia, and she's here to discuss her new book, Dancing with Salome, Courting the Uncanny with Oscar Wilde and Friends. Dancing with Salome unmasks the occult aspects of Oscar Wilde's celebrated tome, The Picture of Dorian Gray, while exploring how the unseen manifested not just in the famous author's life, but in that of his love interest, Lord Alfred Douglas. Through a series of interlinking essays, Nina Antonia takes us to meet the decadent demimond of the 1890s, with whom Wilde and Douglas mingled. While eroticism and mysticism were key themes of the decadence, there was also a surge of interest in ritual magic, enabled by the flowering of the Golden Dawn. Wilde's wife, Constance, was a member, as was W.B. Yeats, alongside Aleister Crowley. All would play a part, directly or indirectly, in the drama of Oscar Wilde's enchanted and accursed life. Nina Antonia will be presenting this work and more as part of our Psychoanalysis Art in the Occult series at Morbid Anatomy Museum. She will be presenting on Sunday, April 24th, alongside Robert Pudgersky, who's presenting Activating Wild's World View. To find more information, you can visit the Psychoanalysis Art and the Occult website, psychartcult.org, or visit morbidanatomy.org slash events. Also coming up in the Psychoanalysis Art and the Occult series at Morbid Anatomy Museum online via Zoom, on March 27th, we have The Complete Story, How Anton LaVey Created the Complete Witch, presented by Peggy Nadramia, High Priestess of the Church of Satan. That's Sunday, March 27th. And then, later on in the series, on May 22nd, we have The Death Drive on Film, presented by Mary Wilde, and The Revolution Will Go Viral, on Sexting, the Digital, and Contagion by Dr. Clint Burnham. Information on all of these, again, can be found at psychartcult.org and morbidanatomy.org slash events. To follow Nina Antonia on social media, you can find her at ninaantonia13 at Twitter, and at Instagram at official Nina Antonia. You can also visit her website, ninaantoniaauthor.com. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. As with all Rendering Unconscious episodes, there is a video of this at YouTube. Visit Trapart Films' YouTube channel. That's youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Trapart Film at YouTube. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Vanessa 23 Carl. Thank you so much to our Patreon patrons for your support. Your support is greatly appreciated. We really, really love having you there. So thank you so much. Well, I love your book so much. You know how much I love this book. It's such a fantastic book and it inspired me. I went, I have like an anthology of uh, the complete Oscar Wilde and it is starts it, it inspired me to dive into this and now I'm reading all of his stories so I started with Dorian Gray wow. of course um, it's so amazing well it's great to think that that dancing with Salome inspired you 
It's very inspiring. What inspired you to start writing about these topics? That's a very interesting question. I, I mean, I sort of always go about things the wrong way around. I actually was very interested in this chap. Can you see that? Yes, I, we have that book, of course. <laughs> oh, we do? oh, good. Okay, so Incurable is... Um, there were no books, or well, there hadn't been any books published of, of Lionel Johnson's work in 30 years, I think. And although he's very important in the story of Oscar Wilde because he introduced Lord Alfred Douglas to Oscar Wilde, um, wild biographers tend to just skip over him like he's the, the stepping stone they can't be bothered with. And I felt, oops. I felt very sorry, for, I felt sorry for him. And one of the things that I think is, is interesting about biographies is it is a bit like being a medium or hearing spirit voice, or at least for me anyway, because I never go about, well, what's practical? Who would be good to write about in this moment in time? I just felt that it was time to kind of, give Lionel Johnson a new profile, get his work out there to a more popularist audience because another problem with Lionel is, is academics love to keep him as tiny and as hidden away as possible, like he's their little secret. And I, I actually thought that he had a much wider appeal than that. He had a very good sense of humor. Um, and I fibbed actually when I said there'd be nothing out about Lionel because, um, you know, Barry Humphreys, who's Dame Edna Everidge? I don't. I don't. Oh, the Australian comedian that says, hello, possums. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and wears the big diamond glasses. Well, Barry Humphreys has got one of the biggest libraries of decadent literature in the world. And... Um, he issued for friends only some photocopied um, poems of Lionel's. So that's <laughs> somewhere in, in about 15 years ago. But other than that, Lionel was this stepping stone. And I thought, you know what? There were three people in that room uh, when Johnson introduced Lord Alfred Douglas to Wilde. So let's write about the three of them, not, not ignore Johnson. That's amazing. And I think the point of like, like, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the times we live in and how it's kind of like fiction has started like creating reality. But I had never realized that Wilde had written Dorian Gray before meeting Douglas. I always I always assumed that they were he was like kind of based on him. But the fact that he wrote it before and then met this kind of character come to life and had this, you know, a love affair, you know, it's like it's just an amazing story. And it's, it's amazing, too, that that although there's been many great biographies written about Wilde, the folklore aspect of his life, the fact that both of his parents were very prominent folklorists um, and very early and important folklorists sort of threaded their beliefs, their visions of pagan Ireland into... Oscar's childhood and so for example when he had a younger sister and very sadly she died and his mother said that she heard or Wilde said that they'd heard the banshee crying and which is something that Yates also talks about that his mother said she could hear the banshee wail when his younger brother died this was that sort of magic, furries, elementals, curses, um, being aware of how you treat nature was very much alive to the Irish writers of the time. Um, you know, where you, uh, Wilde's father, William, built their holiday home. He probably shouldn't have, but on, on the site of what was considered the great fairy battleground of, of Ireland where the two opposing sides of fairies um, 
went to war. So it was a place sacred to the fairies. You're not actually supposed to build on that, but he did. And I think as, as somewhere it says in the book, um, poor Speranza, Oscar's mother, it ended up feeling that that house never brought them any happiness. You yeah, know? no wonder. So, <laughs> yeah, no wonder. And how did you become interested in Johnson in the first place? Um, in Lionel. Mm -hmm. Be, just, just because he was the ignored one and I very, I'm not really interested in wildly successful people who I think wild is interesting but he's been written by many about by many brilliant people so I always like to write about more marginalized voices or voices that aren't heard and I thought it was time for Lionel who's been virtually written out of of history to be written back in again yeah absolutely and of course like well with the magical aspects and the folklore aspects like you're saying that aspect of a lot of prominent people has been written out, you know, historically. And I, I love that you're bringing that back in. And, uh, and it seems like a lot of people are kind of bringing that back in to understanding these artists and writers, because you can't really understand them without these kinds of worldviews. It's like uh, seeing only a very, like, narrow view of their work if you ignore kind of these contexts. Um, well, I think that's what's interesting about Therese Taylor writing the introduction. She writes a fantastic introduction because um, she's a university lecturer. And I think one of the issues is academia, where most writers come from, I don't know why, um, has tended always to marginalise magic or the pagan or furry law or whatever and just put it into a corner because that's that's for the weirdos but in fact if you've got artists and as you say artists do draw on those sorts of liminal characters it just seems yes that a whole dimension is ignored that shouldn't be exactly even with like philosophers like a lot of times people like they take like this part of their philosophy that seems like rational, you know, but they like ignore the fact that say they like worshiped Hecate or something, you know, and it's like, well, why do you think yes. that this part of their thought is valid, but not this other part of their thought? Like, who are you to choose, like, which part of their thought you want to look at, you know? Um, well, I, I wrote down a great quote earlier this week because I, I've been reading a very good book that's pertinent to all of this called The Trickster by George P. Hansen. Have you read it? No. Well, it's very good, but he is, he's a very rational person, but he's asking why are Fortean subjects always marginalized? And partly I think society is frightened of the unrational because that way madness and civilization can fall apart. Um, but he says that, that rationalization is the death of enchantment. And I think that's where we've reached now, just to believe that the secular world is all that there is. You know, I, I uh, love the Irish idea that you had to be careful when you were closing the windows or the doors in case you, you trapped a spirit of some kind in the door frame. I just thought it was really... <laughs> I love things Sensitive. like that. And yeah. I'm glad you reminded me because when I was reading the book, I then got into Wild, but I wanted to order like his mother's book as well so I could read the folklore she wrote about. Oh, it's really good. Has it arrived yet? Mm -mm. No, her, it's with it, something like Legends and Charms of Ireland is really, really good. Yeah, I look forward to that. Yeah. And it's, it's, I think, I mean, I do think the Irish fairy law is actually the best in the world. Scottish is very good. Welsh is, is, they've got a particular fascination for sort of ladies of the lake. It's very interesting. Um, and the English have their own fairy law, but Irish was the most romantic and the most in-depth and, um, yeah. I, I, the other thing is I, I have a lovely book by um, a nurse who, who says maybe, and this is probably something Colin Wilson said, we probably all 
did have second sight, but education and modern life shuts it down, and maybe deliberately or subconsciously so. Yeah, exactly. No, I definitely yeah. believe that, that like uh, your kind of socialization through education, like you're saying, like normalizes everyone and makes people s stop trusting their own perceptions and kind of intuitions to say, oh, well, no, if I if I see that synchronicity or, or this kind of thing or that other thing, you know, that means I'm irrational. That means I'm headed towards the road of psychosis and it's like a negative thing. So it like trains people to kind of ignore their own experiences and take what the society tells them is right as the real right point of view uh, and not their own point of view. And I think that's a really dangerous and disempowering individ for individuals. It's a way of controlling yeah, people, I think. It's, it's, it's all to have a world without wonder. And, and this is what it's becoming. You buy your wonder from Disney, but in fact, that wonder is in, in all of us and... I think a lot has to do with how much of nature we've destroyed as well, because we're part of nature. So we've been killing ourselves and killing the planet. How are we supposed to be healthy if we can't see the wonder and the joy of it anymore? Very sad. Absolutely. Exactly. What is a life without wonder? Not fun at all. <laughs> No, no. So we, we will keep trying to instill wonder where we can. Absolutely. And I think like magical practices, and I love reading the whenever we traveled somewhere, when we used to travel, I always like to get yes. a, a book of folklore from wherever we visited, because you learn so much about a culture by reading those stories. I think that's very true. Yes. Yes. That's a lovely idea. Yeah, it's really fun and rich. Have you, have you come across any, is it Tontes? Why do you been living there what is it any any of the little people of sweden oh yes when you walk in the forest i feel like absolutely you can see like in where like certain tree roots are and things like that i'm like oh that's a little door like to where they live like i totally feel like they're they're around in that way you know you can see kind of their little entrances and exits when you're walking around the forest i love being in the forest where we moved to to this house it's surrounded by like so much forest and so we get to walk around in the forest it's so nice yeah oh, that's lovely it will inspire you I mean one of the things I wonder is that I've been living in the same area for 30 years and it's a village and it's a nature preservation area wow. um even though it's in London and I think well is that what's made me start to think about things I might not have thought of before who knows Absolutely. I think but you're I very, definitely. I was going to say that I've always been interested in more marginal figures, though, that that's stayed with me through the whole of my writing. Um, I won't say career, I'll say vocation. Yeah, well, and especially like people do focus on tend to focus on certain individuals because they've been written about and then you can rewrite and rewrite, write more about them. But of course, like all the people that they were in touch with and working with and collaborating with are also very interesting. And it's great to like widen that bouquet and get some more perspectives. Of course, yes. Yeah, that's what needs to happen. Otherwise, if, because if, what happens is mainstream publishers are quite happy to issue the same books about people with different authors year in and year out. And it's it's incredible that people don't get, don't say, oh, come on, please, let's have a bit of a revolution and start on who's on the bookshelves. Maybe that will happen. I don't and, know. I don't and know. I'm sure yeah. you notice too when you write, it's like uh, when I wrote my most recent book, it's like you notice that people always reference the same authors over and over again. It's like everybody's referencing. Yeah. So if like one person writes a book, you know, 30 years ago and they say something is true, everybody just quotes that as if it's true. And then I'm like, that doesn't sound right. And so like I go back and read like the text because I happen to be familiar with that author that they're quoting. And I'm like, yeah, that's not what they're saying at all here, you know? But like it's been repeated so many times and people don't go back to the yeah. original source. So, so that's why you have to challenge things and keep challenging things. I mean, the, my favorite chapter to read and or to write in Dancing with Salome was was the one 
um, Bosie and the Beast, which is, is the one about how Alistair Crowley kind of stalked through literary means Lord Alfred Douglas. And I felt desperate to write this because the Crowley crowd, who seemed to be legion, often say, oh, well, Lord Alfred Douglas did take Crowley to court, um, which isn't true. And they don't see, they've, they've not looked at how Douglas repeats as a motif throughout Crowley's written work. So that is all new stuff. And also Crowley had a very evil sense of humor. So I I read one of the experts um, and it was, it was about one of Crowley's essays, but what in fact Crowley is doing is having a joke. He's lying. He was a notorious liar. So you, I don't know that that gets lost by repeating things over and over again. It becomes perceived knowledge. So you get all this back slapping when nobody actually challenges it and says, sorry, guys, it's actually incorrect or try looking at it this way or challenging it. You know, read some of Lord Alfred Douglas's work, learn about it from his perspective, and then you could see what Alistair Crowley was up to. Absolutely. Yeah, I had never heard of any of that. That was all totally new material. And actually, everything you wrote about in this book, it's like, it might be a familiar, like, main storyline that people know. There's so many details. And like you said, other characters and influences that I've never seen written about. Yes. Yeah, I, I think it. what people are writing about, it doesn't have to be the same, same old, although mainstream publishers seem to feel safer with that, or, or they're very fashionable now. So they'll choose what's a fashionable subject, but that won't be fashionable in a year or so's time, so. How did you come to that story with Crowley? Um, through realization, through, I'd started reading it and I, you know, the bit in, in Diary of a Drug Fiend where whatever it is, Lord Bumble or the Earl of Bumble walks in and it's, it's very, very funny. And it says, it's obviously it's Douglas and his nose twitches with fury. And I just thought, this is absolutely hilarious. I just, just started unraveling it like a present and the other one was the ideal idol which again um you can reference it to reggie hastings the green carnation character whatever it just you know when you have a moment of the light bulb goes on and you think i know what he's doing here he's mm -hmm. so naughty <laughs> and i love his poems about douglas i think that they are absolutely hilarious and amongst his best even though they're very cruel and they're very sly they're very funny no they're great they're wonderful yeah i should, should have read them um is it a slim gilt soul and there's another one that it's an acrostic poem and and that's where his um lord alfred douglas name is actually spelled out it's the first initial of each line which yeah, great fun to unravel the way that Crowley was thinking and what he went about doing to his enemies. <laughs> and I, I think that he was just jealous of Lord Alfred Douglas. Mm -hmm. He would have liked to have been a real, a real member of aristocracy. He would have liked to have, have <laughs> made society absolutely distraught before he was 25 he had to work very hard for his infamy but lord alfred douglas just just <laughs> had it to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he just had to smile at wild and that was it <laughs> but i also love how you pointed out that you know bozy had been uh, like demonized by a lot of people and like really you know he's this young beautiful guy you know it's like I didn't think he had any ulterior motives <laughs> to ruin Oscar Wilde's life or anything <laughs> no I mean I think he was very upset with his father I think he had issues from childhood but who doesn't <laughs> 
who doesn't? Um, I think it was George Bernard Shaw that said that Wilde was probably loved too much and Bosie was loved too little. So, but you know, ev every relationship has its foibles, and I think the other the other thing is de profundus whether Wilde was just getting this. <laughs> how upset he was and of course he would be upset out of his system we have to remember that that he was not Robbie Ross was his first boyfriend and all of a sudden Wilde takes up with Bosie who is very good looking Ross wasn't particularly good looking I mean would you write to an ex-partner oh blah 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 is here with me and he's so divine he's lying on the sofa you know like a hyacinth beautiful in all ways you're sending that to your ex-partner and your ex-partner is then supposed to like like the beautiful hyacinth it's not going to work so in a way just as sometimes mistresses are set at each other's throats for a collision course or a mistress and a wife exactly the same thing happened with with ross and lord alfred douglas so and wilde jumps away from any responsibility because he's now a saint you know but um we've also been raised in an era and in screen if you've ever done a screenwriting course you have to have a clear protagonist and um, I spoke to the estate of Lord Alfred Douglas, and they've, they've read every single book about Wilde. And the gentleman, John Stratford, he said that this backlash against Bosie didn't actually start until the 60s. Mm. Um, yeah. Once journalists couldn't actually speak to Lord Alfred Douglas, and it grew from there because we are used to Hollywood films where there's a good guy and there's a bad guy. There's black and there's white, but... Life isn't like that. It's, as you know. No, exactly. Yeah. So. That's interesting that they started demonizing him more after he passed. So typical, but so frustrating. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, um, and I suppose people, people want their books to sell, so they're going to say contentious things, but I don't think that you should carry on kicking a corpse after it's dead it's it's not nice and um i think they were yeah they both screwed each other up what can i say and yeah. but they loved each other and that much is it's clear and yeah yeah and they were put through the ringer both of them by society you know yeah, they were judged very harshly by society, but we should stop judging Bosie. And this was a person who Wilde loved. And Wilde states that Lord Alfred loved him, and that should be enough. But there's an industry, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the, that kind of thing sells. They're just trying to sell, like you said. <laughs> yeah. It's like ratings. It's like in the US, also, the news is so like. You know, instead of the news just like reporting the news, it like makes you upset, you know, so that you keep watching so that they can get more like advertising money when really like probably the news should just be the news and not <laughs> be so uh, oh, exciting wow. like that. <laughs> that's that's a, a revolutionary idea. I remember when the news used to be the news? I don't, but <laughs> I'm glad that it was once. <laughs> It was and then we got color television and i remember for the first time it not being about the news it being about the news readers the color of his tiger oh it's blue it's red whatever it's just like wow but anyway that that was a big tangent mm -hmm. but the news it's not a tangent it grabs people's attention <laughs> then they made it just like ladies with low cut blouses you know <laughs> yes i know i know <laughs> I mean, well, it was Providence because you helped edit this, didn't you? When I was absolutely exhausted. I did. <laughs> and I loved it. Yeah, I got to read it close to first. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's true, actually. I really loved it. It got me so excited, especially because I get like, I, I have to read academic things sometimes just to like keep in the loop of what's going on. 
but so often I get it just makes me so tired you know I just like get so tired and when I read your book I was like so energized and like this this is what I like to read like this is exciting it's new it's interesting it includes all these things that I love like literature and the arts and magic and folklore and uh, these like relationships they're really catching on their own they don't need to be too dramatized they're pretty exciting just the way they are you know I, th- I mean I think I think academic academia has its place of course I do and I think it is it's wonderful to be able to learn we need learned people but we've kind of reached this thing in England where publishers seem to think that they're not going to take writers on without academic histories. And an an academic is a different thing to a creative writer. They're not the same things. No, absolutely. And I'm actually trying to bring more like magic and these kinds of mythological beliefs back into the academic discourse, because like you said, they're so like pushed to the side as like that's for something else. But actually I'm trying to show academics that that's you know, there's a movement of like de- decolonization and trying to see how people were kind of like whitewashed and their cultures taken away from colonization. And I'm trying to show that like pagan practices, folklore practices, folk magic, that's that was all taken away during colonization. So if you keep pushing that to the side, you're actually being like very racist, basically. <laughs> that's, uh, no, but that's a, it's a really good point. I, the other thing that I noticed was, was, and forgive me for this, it's just, I, I love all the folklore stuff as much as you do, but I've noticed now that it's, a, it's, it's almost a lot of privileged young women writing about peasant law as if it's theirs. Mm-hmm. But these were the people that they probably would have driven past, past in those far off days it's just it's just an odd conundrum really it's very true um because it it is the sort of law of the land and the law of the soil and anybody that feels it has some ownership of it it can't just be for the people that have got the ma no, exactly, because those are the no, people who've been trained to think in a certain way. And we don't want to read only one way of thinking. <laughs> we want to read uh, lots of ways of thinking. <laughs> yes. yes, because that's that society. But I, I do like your I did like your point about the colonization of how folklore suffered. Um, it's quite it's very interesting. I must send you I've got a book written by a priest in the 18th century and it's about (laughs) they didn't but trying to balance respect for pagan cultures while setting the christian church up and i think some people were more um accepting than others but i there is a story and i don't know if it's true or not about a priest who apparently had a statue of Pan in the garden. Have you heard this one? No. <laughs> had had the um, the congregation himself would skip around the statue once a year, and uh, the higher ups found out about it, and he was defrocked. But there's also another very good book that should be published. Should be republished. Um, I think it's called Four, 40 Years in a Something or Other Parish. And it's about, it sounds like a Hollywood musical movie, I should say. It's about a priest who moves to a very small community in Yorkshire at the end of the 18th century when these beliefs have vanished, apparently. And actually, it's not because he has members of the congregation going, Hero, there, she put a curse on me. Or, you know, and people saying to him, No, you can't dig anything by that tree. That's a tree where the pixies live. He actually writes in a very benevolent and caring way. And he respects the people, but it's it's a wonderful clash of of different cultures and different learning. Um, And that should definitely, I think that should be on syllabuses i think it's 40 years in a moorland parish is what it's called it's very hard to get hold of been collecting these books for a long time now yeah it sounds amazing 
Yes, when well, when you can travel again, you'll have to come over and look at these books, or maybe I can scan them or something for you. That would be really fun. We have to visit. Yes, you do. The last how long ago was it when you were last in London? Oh man, I think we we went in 2019. We went to Robert Ansel and Aisha's wedding, and uh, yeah, and we visited Val and Gail Denham. And we went to Wales that same trip. So it must have been July of 2019. Mm. And I think before that, we had a bo the book launch for the Fenris 8 at uh, Atlantis. And that was 2016, I think. So it's been well, too was long. It? Well, and that <laughs> was that. Rosie and the Beast was, was first published in that edition of um, Fenris. Exactly. I also, you know the way Hammer Horror and Amicus Films, I think it was, used to do, they used to link up four or five short stories and give them the strange name of Portmanteau, I think. Um, that's what Dancing with Salome is. So it's all, all the essays in there are all sort of interconnected. Yeah, absolutely. So I love got, when things come together like that. I didn't realize they were connected when I was, well, I sort of did when I was writing them, but then I, I again, you know, the light bulb goes on. I thought, wouldn't it be lovely to have them all in one book? That would work. So it works perfectly. Um, and so I'm very grateful to Carl and to you for, for seeing that. Lots of fantastic book. What are you working on now? I never say I, I'm really that's that's one of my self-made superstitions that I never say I'm I'm doing my reading and it will hopefully be with the wonderful strange attractor who put out incurable yes. um and they're doing things like trap art are doing which is popular and popular culture stuff that is has been sidelined but actually is is very important i don't know how this maybe this fad for stifling certain voices and beliefs has always existed it just seems so dominant that you have to keep fighting against it all the time it's really true and it really surprises me like like for with like genesis for example it's like a perfect example when i was in new york and I met friends that were like, you know, trained in art schools. And they, they were like, I didn't know that Genesis was a, a cultist until I met you. And I was like, how did you not know that? Like, when you look at these things, like, what are you seeing? You're like, just seeing some sort of art object. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't even understand what people are looking at, you know, <laughs> or what they think they're looking at. <laughs> that's, no, that's, that's a very good point because you, you shouldn't, but you assume people are seeing with the same understanding as you. No, but they're not. And they're definitely not teaching that in art school. Maybe they are now. Jesse Bransford is is like uh, runs a like art program at, at NYU, so that's good because he's uh, an occultist. And um, yeah, so that's good that we're we're around in like nice places. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it joins up to what Therese Taylor is doing as well. I mean, I think the whole thing about rationaliz rationalization, destroying enchantment, can go. it goes as so far as, as to miracles as well. It's all part of the same spectrum. The, the unseen shouldn't be ridiculed. It's, it's, I don't know why people... Do that. They're so terrified of, of going outside of the very narrow perimeters, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, to me, life doesn't make sense without it. I don't understand how things are being made sense of if you don't have the unconscious or the unseen or the uncanny. It's like it's so present to me that I don't, I don't know how to not see it. Is it. What led you to becoming a psychologist? Um, well, I just always loved Freud and Jung, like in high school. And I think, I don't know, it's just something I was always interested in. And I've always been like, 
you know, the friend that's always like there listening to the crying friend. You know, it's like I'm always that friend that will like run over to your house and help you. Um, so I've always just kind of naturally been like that and wanting to help people and make them feel better. And um, yeah, so it just came kind of naturally. And at some point, you know, when I got to college level, I was originally, I actually first started studying psychology and then I started getting into like accounting because I'm good at math and then I was gonna like be an accountant and I went this like weird route and then I was like well I'm good at math and science maybe I should become an MD so then I started like taking all these science classes to go to medical school and then I came back around to like I was like looking at medical schools and they were all like like the psychiatry programs are just like you're just a medical doctor that understands like brain chemistry and prescribing and they don't really learn talk therapy at all anymore like they they used to a long time ago be trained as psychoanalysts a lot of them but that's not the case anymore so then I was like oh I'm not even going to really like learn like what Freud was doing this way so then I realized I need to go to graduate school for psychology so it was like it started there and then I made a loop and I got back there, as so often happens, at least to me. <laughs> Best to go with your first instinct. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, yeah, that is how you learn, I think. Um, if I mean, I, I came up through through the punk era, and but all all the people that I've written about, it makes us. Uh, sense to me people will go oh she's doing supernatural stuff now but but i was still always writing about marginalized characters and certainly somebody like johnny thunders which is my first book he had so much charisma and you have to wonder well, what is charisma you know mm -hmm. it's a way of enchanting people but sometimes when you get people that are very charismatic it's I don't think Johnny knew what to do with it it was kind of like an, an out of control fire within him he was so brilliant live um so that's been that's all been part of my journey and you know I on my 13th birthday like I had to make a wish I remember this and my wish was oh I want to meet Johnny Thunders and I remember saying this to a therapist and she said something about and she was she was very nice but it was about um magical realism or something being quite a dangerous path to go down and and I just thought well why if if you focus on something that and you really want it to happen as long as you're not upsetting anybody or you know I don't know, causing bad things to happen in the pursuit of it, then what is wrong with it, with having that th that wish? I mean, yeah. It How else are you going to be driven to do something? <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. And so that, that was my life. Yeah. All, all the books have been sort of things that I felt absolutely driven to. I did, never had a career plan. Yeah, no, you just have to take it like one step to the next, like what happens next? And then another thing comes up. I feel like you can't plan to, I mean, I think this pandemic has shown you can't plan too far into the future. You know, you never know what's going to happen. When I grew up in Miami, I never imagined in a million years I would move to Sweden. You know, it's like Sweden was like never even a thought in my mind, you know, so you never know what's going to happen. You just have to be, and if you have too much of a plan, I feel like it's good, then you're not going to have, you have too much blinders on and be too focused on like what your idea of what you want is. And you might not notice like opportunities coming up. And I, and like you said, that light bulb going off, I always feel like this spark when something's like going to lead me somewhere, I get this like real spark of like electricity. And I'm like, if I get that feeling, then I know I should go towards that. Cause that's going to be really like a good for me. Yeah. And inspiring. That's, that's all your instincts going. Yes, this is, this is right for this me. Is it. I mean, I think, I, I mean, I started writing because I had a horrible childhood and I've always suffered from depression and writing has always been a way to escape it because I can escape into other worlds. And that feeling of being totally absorbed in creativity is wonderful. It's like having a holiday. <laughs> 
Absolutely. I think it's the best thing anyone can do is be creative in whatever way they feel compelled to create. Yeah. Yes. Um, anyway, what else do you want to know? <laughs> what, what else crossed your mind when you were looking through Dancing with Salome? Oh, boy. That was the, those were the things that I remember sparked my interest the most. I would love to hear more about Lionel. We, we talked about him not being just a stepping stone, but let's hear what else did you learn about him? What was he like? Well, I think, I mean, Lionel was, Lionel was the key in the door. Lionel was the one that I got interested in first. Um, I don't know, he's just a very delicate creature, really. I love the fact that he was so ephemeral there's a there's a beautiful victorian phrase um that i can't remember but somebody used it to describe lionel and also aubrey beardsley because they were friends and they called them day lilies which meant they their lives were so short they only blossomed for a day um ernest dowson was the other one um there's a great delicacy to them and I, I also like Lionel because <laughs> he was quite tortured, but he's he's like a pre-goth. Um, you know, so it was fun for me in a funny way to write about what it must have been like growing up in, in the era of Queen Victoria because when her beloved Prince Albert died, then... I suppose England became this incredibly gothic place. You know, they had big supermarkets almost of morning clothes and morning jewellery. Mm. They'd have superstores, uh, just quite incredible. And funeral cards, it became uh, this, from this, from Victoria's morning, this sort of whole memorial culture grew up. And that's what Lionel grew up in. So when everybody was sleeping at school and at university he'd be you know going around visiting cemeteries and seeing if, if he could understand what death was and talking to the dead and it's very interesting and also in perhaps his best essay which is called incurable he he compares himself to Ophelia which I, I think is very interesting this sort of I don't know, floating, floating down the river to his doom. So he knew, he knew he was sort of a doomed figure. Um, certainly, he was like the changeling in his family. He came from a military family, and his older brothers were all, you know, sergeants in the army, and so was his father. Um, but Lionel never grew beyond about five foot, and was very poetic and yes, pre goth um, he took the female parts in when they were doing Shakespeare at school. Um, and there is a, this, the thing with Lionel that's interesting is we go through his poetry, we go through his drinking, and then finally we go to this great big odd climax where, where he's living in an apartment where there's the sort of, it goes all Edgar Allan Poe when he believes he's being haunted by a giant bird ghost, um, which is quite extraordinary. And he died not long after that. Um, so it's the last unexplained ghost story of the Victorian era. So if you look at the histories, the stories of Wilde and Bosey and Lionel Johnson, they all have this very strange supernatural thread that's inescapable running throughout all their lives. Yeah, and that story with yeah. the bird in that house and that place was really interesting as well. I mean, yeah, it's really, it's it's really very out there. But I think, I mean, I love the 1890s because the people that I've written about and Yates they saw the new century coming on with the horrors of war and everything. So it's this very special moment filled with magic and wonder, almost as if they sensed that 
the coming age is not going to be easy. There's not going to be dreamers. There's going to be an awful lot of tragedy. And also society was moving to a more material age anyway. I mean, the only bit for me in Dorian Gray that doesn't work is when he goes to the opium den and he goes to, I think it's Blue Gate Fields. And Gustav Dore drew photographs, of, drew illustrations of the poor of Blue Gate Fields. I mean, it was, it was absolutely horrendous. So you've got the overspill of people that had worked on the land now having to go to London to find work and becoming impoverished. So these are all the aspects of, of the new century bearing down. And I don't think Lionel couldn't have, have lived at another time or, you know, always with his little top hat on, um, being a perfect gentleman. I mean, he's almost sort of tailor-made to become a ghost. I love that. And I love how you said too that you kind of have to be a medium and like like kind of get to know these spirits. And I've seen a lot of actors lately actually like on really mainstream television, like Javier Bardem, um, say that they like kind of invoke the spirit of like if they're act acting a certain person, like he was acting Ricky Ricardo recently, uh mm -hmm. Arnaz. And uh, he said, you have to kind of like Im invoke the spirit and really kind of let them possess you. And I love that like mainstream actors are speaking about that on TV as well now. Well, I suppose they know that process uh, which you have to do with writing where you, you sort of have to open yourself up, don't you? And pull whatever it is down that you need for your inspiration so that you can you can write these words. Um, it's, it's really quite fascinating. And if you get too close to, to certain influences, I think it can be quite dangerous. But what, what is inspiration? Is it, is it angels talking to us? Is it, is it God? Is it divinity? Is it, what is it? What do you think it is? I think it's whatever people want it to be. I, I always think of it as kind of the unconscious or the collective kind of memory of, of humanity. But I absolutely, like, I have friends that work with spirits, that they work with, like, spirit possession. And, you know, I say, yeah. <laughs> whatever it is for you, what form it takes for you, it could be different for different people, you know? And But the desire to reach out to the divine or the unseen seems to be imprinted in the human soul, just exactly. like you say about the unconscious. So, so why why this fear? Is it so that we become more materialistic? Yeah, exactly. I feel like it's really a way to control people, you know. And I feel like a lot of times people are, you know, people often say they're afraid that they're like not good enough, or they have imposter syndrome or something. But I think at the root of a lot of things is that people are actually afraid with how much power they actually have. When you start kind of harnessing your potential and your kind of spark, you know, you can really do a lot of things. <laughs> people can look at what we've accomplished. You know, imagine, you know, we've accomplished so much and like built these like societies are still fighting. I feel like we're really intelligent, like intellectually. But then we have these like emotional, we're not very like, we haven't moved very far along emotionally. We're like caught up in these like, you know, sibling rivalries and things like this. That we're still really like infantile and holding us back. And imagine if we could like develop a little bit more in that direction and really like work together more and harness things. Even in the beginning of the pandemic, when people like actually stopped traveling and they started seeing like, how much like nature was coming back a bit and fog smog was like going away just from like a few days or weeks of us not yeah. driving and things. Yeah. So we could actually like turn this thing around <laughs> if we like decided to do that. But for some reason, we're not doing that too much. Mm. No, unfortunately humans tend to be very, we're flawed, aren't we? And the, the greed is, is a terrible curse upon humanity. 
Yeah, and I think also it's it's like what the society wants or like the governing body a lot of times seems to be at odd with what may be best for us <laughs> uh, as like citizens or people. So we're kind of like pitted against and, the, and this overarching structure, you know, that's what really needs to change, but I don't know how to change that. Well, <laughs> if, even if we start with books, that look at things differently with different perspectives and keep fighting for different views and perspectives to be heard, then that would be something. I yeah. mean, you know, I certainly feel with each passing year, even though my books are read and I hear from people, people say really lovely things. I've never been able to get a foothold inside the establishment. Um, but it hasn't, it hasn't stopped me writing. So perhaps there's a very clear process of who gets to be heard, if, if, you know, because the status quo, the big fear must be the status quo getting messed up. And I also think, and you, you can tell me that I'm wrong, yeah. that there's a huge death fear that stops people from thinking outside very rigid lines as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Are there any other books that you've written that you want to be sure to mention? Well, I can't reach it because it's on high up on the shelf, but there is a trinity to um, Incurable and Dancing with Salome, and that is my novel, The Greenwood Fawn, in which Lionel comes back as a ghost. Oh, I need to read that. Um, and finds true love in, in Victorian London. Oh, I love it. Um, so you probably would. It's it's got lots of lots of those things in uh, lots of different aspects. Pan is reborn in London, in Victorian London, and there's this magical manuscript that that so if you if you're an evil person and you plan works of evil and you read it then you get an evil ending but if your heart is filled with love then then all the, all the good things of life will come to you wouldn't that be it. lovely if that was yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but that's right we read novels <laughs> yes yes but um i like faction i like books that work between truth and fiction so faction has always been one of my, my favorite words. Yeah, I love novels it's like really that as well. Oh, really? Okay, tell me your favorite novel. Oh, boy, my favorite novel. That's a tough one. Right now I'm reading, right now I'm reading the Ripley series by Patricia Heisman, and I am loving it. I had actually never read the, the Ripley series before, and I'm three books in out of five. And I, I read a lot of these like detective stories and things. And I always love when they're set in like historical circumstances so that you can like learn a bit about history and like what a place might have been like while you're like reading this kind of exciting detective story. So I love things like that. I was going to say, apparently during the pandemic, book sales went up. Which oh, is one of the few good things. Yeah. <laughs> um, so all, all the predicament about will Kindle take over? Will it be the death of the book? Thank God is is not true. Yeah, I can't read on the screens. I have to have a book. We have way I can't say too many books, but we have too many books. <laughs> we have a lot of books. <laughs> all the best people um have too many books. I, I mean, I, my books sell via Kindle. I was surprised to say, and I'm grateful to say, but I don't have Kindle myself. I, I can't read off a screen either. What's so your sort of favorite a, novel? I don't read that many novels. I'm, I'm trying to finish up. Oh, I'll show you this. Okay, just wait there. I, I got this wonderful. What well, it's. Two volume set. Oh, Elder Faiths of Ireland. Ooh. Um, and when I opened it up, it's not to be taken away from the 
Theosophical Society. Can you see that? Yeah. That's quite that's quite an amazing book plate to find in there. Very cool. Um, but that's that's what kind of fascinates me. When earth do people find books that are centuries old and they're in mint condition? Where have they been? What magical place? <laughs> I'll tell you another story that somebody who is a librarian told me, and this is supposed to be true, that there was a lorry load of um, supernatural and fortune books being transferred from one library to another in London, and the van went missing, and they've never retrieved all those books. Mm. Where did they go to? It's kind of a 14 story in itself. Was there anything else you wanted to be sure to mention that we didn't get to? Um, I don't think so. I love books. I love the scent of old <laughs> books. My favorite perfumes, that thing of, of, you know, when you can smell time and rain and dust and it's, it's wonderful. And, uh, Yes, I hope that I have the strength to write this new book, which that for me, because my health hasn't been all that, but uh, I still have the desire to write, and that's the main thing. Absolutely. And, um, I look forward to please, it when it's ready. <laughs> I was going to say, please connect when people buy Dancing with Salome and, and uh, make yeah, it a best I'll link to everything. I'll link to everything. And then, of course, we're so excited to have you at Morbid Anatomy, and that'll be in April. Oh, yes, I'm very excited to be doing that as well. It's <laughs> Morbid Anatomy is a great title. So shall we say goodbye just for now? Sure. So lovely to have you, Nina. Well, it was lovely to talk to you. So, oh, we've been nattering for an hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right lots of love take care and i'll see you for morbid anatomy bye bye thank you for listening to rendering unconscious you've just heard a discussion with nina and tonia Join us on April 24th as she presents as part of our Psychoanalysis Art and the Occult series, The Uncanny Aspects of Oscar Wilde, Dancing with Salome, Decadence, and the Supernatural. Presenting alongside her is Robert Pogursky, who will be presenting Activating Wilde's World View. That's Sunday, April 24th at 2 p.m. New York City time, live via Zoom. Visit psychartcult.org and morbidanatomy.org slash events for links and more information. You can follow me at Twitter and Instagram at rawsin underscore at Twitter and Instagram. You can also find me on TikTok at Dr. Vanessa Sinclair 23. Follow Nina Antonia on social media at Nina Antonia 13 at Twitter and official Nina Antonia at Instagram, as well as check out her website, Nina Antonia Author.com. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. You can visit the main website for the podcast, renderingunconscious.org, for more episodes and more information, as well as my website, drvanessasinclair.net. Rendering Unconscious is also a book, Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry, available from Chapart Books, 2019. For more, you can visit our publisher's website, trapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net.
have dared to traverse. Then announces that perversion as sexual, we are all acts, pleasure that deviate from the purpose that we are all perverse. Dominant and submissive, we gain pleasure, consciousness, gender, and sexuality that make or structure was completely dismantled. The attempts to break down human sexuality while ourselves, to ourselves, polymorphously perverse. Likely a course as any described perversion in this way. Everyone that I've ever dreamed of being. These categories, but this is all part of human. Therefore, occupy both and all have dared to traverse. Sexuality is fluid and the object that we are simply sexual. Thoughts about Freud and as they were both working, desire is, are the, attribute is perfect. Experiences and each is just as valid and third mind, in this case, a third being.